ePod Studios. Get ready, get ready. It's time now for Zolak and Bertrand. Brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks on 98.5 The Sports Hub. I'll just say this. Um, I wouldn't rule Bill out for this year quite yet. Oh, oh. The big fella's been holding. This is breaking sports he's news. Been, he, all day, all day. He's been holding out on us down there. Well, that's timely constipation, holding on to something. Interesting. Greg. The Bama boy was all blocked up until 513. Why wouldn't you rule out something this year? Uh, I I don't want to go into it. I, look, there was a lot of chatter about you know the commanders at one point in time like and i think they got left at the altar by ben johnson um i think with adam peters who worked with the patriots for belichick at one point in time before he went to san francisco i could and bill being maybe a little bit desperate you know maybe playing too strong of a hand with the with the falcons maybe at the prospect of being shut out and never getting another job and never catching don shula Maybe he's changed, you know, his demands and would be okay with, hey, you, you do whatever you want with person. I'm fine with Adam Peter. He could pick all the players. I'm just going to coach. Yeah. Look, I, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying, like, look, there's, I would say there's one job that's big in flux right now. Um, we'll see where Seattle goes. Nobody's quite sure what John Schneider is going to do, but there's another job still out there. And, and just like we said before the end of the season, there were a lot of things, a lot of reasons why that made sense for Bill. Hour number two, Zolak and Bertrand, Phil Perry with us. That's Greg Bedard yesterday on Felger and Maz in the five o'clock hour saying, don't rule out Bill getting a job just yet. He also believes that Ben Johnson left the commanders at the altar that he was the one that reneged and backed out and decided to stay. There was something he didn't like, which, again, who knows? I bet Ben Johnson would tell you I turned them down, and the team would then tell you, no, we didn't want him. He wasn't our guy. It feels like, hey, I mean, to me, in the base, based on everything, the way it was talked about and written and covered, that, yeah, it feels like he left them at the altar. Now it's like they got to scramble and go to plan B. Go luck to that guy, whoever they pick. I, openly I don't wondered, think it's Bill. I openly wondered yesterday whether it was the commanders breaking up with Ben Johnson or Ben Johnson breaking up with the commanders. My buddy J.P. Finley, who covers the commanders down there in D.C., NBC Sports Washington for a long time, really plugged in. He said the commanders were actually on their way out to do a final interview, apparently, with Ben Johnson when he informed them that he was no longer interested. Wow. Now, apparently, they were also planning on interviewing Aaron Glenn for the same job at the same, right about the same time. Mm-hmm. So that trip was going to be on one way or the other, but he made it sound like the commanders were not happy that they were going all this way, and he was telling them basically while they're in the we air. Waited. We waited for the NFC title game. We waited for you to get eliminated. Then we get it, take off, and now you know this is what you do to us. I, I can understand that. I can see why they'd be pissed. Unless Detroit just went to him and said, I know there's, no, there's nothing written where he gets a bump if he stays, but they can redo the contract, give him a boot if they want. Somebody may have gotten him in Detroit. And said, hey, you know, if you're really not ready, we love what we're doing. We'd love to have you back. We'll double your salary here. Just give us some time, a couple months to figure this out. We'll double your salary. I'm going to keep this thing rolling. Keep it together. We're going to attack it in free agency. We're going to get our guys back. They got a lot of guys that are free agents. Um, and maybe he really loves what he's doing there. And just maybe he doesn't feel like I'm ready yet. Because it's a big jump. And I know it's money. And you're passing up a lot of money. But that money's still going to be there next year for him. If well, he's even more successful. And that might be the thing, right? What are we saying about Bill Belichick right now? Hey, the fit, the there fit. could be the Bills could be available. The Cowboys could be available. The Eagles could be available. Maybe Ben Johnson's saying the same thing. Do I really want to go to Washington? Or would I rather bide my time for a year and then next year maybe have the opportunity to coach Josh Allen? That might be a little bit more palatable to me than going to Washington and taking a quarterback with the second overall pick and having no idea how it's going to pan out. Yeah, it's a strange situation there. Do you see I, I Bill as a, do you see Bill as a fit for Washington? No, not at all. Why? Because new owners, the front office, um, they're probably they're, they're an analytical team. They're really based on it, and he Bill likes analytics, but I don't think he uses them in his decision making. 
I think he studies the game that way, understands the game, where it's trying to. Bill's an in-game fill guy. Like, he doesn't sit there buried in his you know, play sheets, jots little notes down to remind himself at halftime, what are we going to readjust here? Um, it just doesn't feel like a fit for me. I don't know. It's it's the commanders. It's Who's your quarterback? They do have some skilled people, though. You know, they got, they got rid of their good defensive guys. But you talked about this when... When the two trades went down, you know, when when Young was sent off to uh, San Francisco there, and the other guy sent off to Chicago, um, you said their their backups are pretty good. Like that's a team that's built to play defense. But how much of that is staying intact, and how does Bill look at that? I just can't see him feeling as though he's got a good shot at breaking the record in Washington. It's multi years, like three or four, yeah. maybe. Yeah. You know, again, you got no. You want to go there and be sub five hundred? Like, I don't think Bill wants to be sub five hundred anymore. No, because th- what does that do for his legacy? Nothing. Worsens it. And you, you're right. Josh Harris, who just bought, and I think listening to Bedard there, it sounded like he had like a little bit of a Freudian slip where he, he mentioned the, the name Snyder. Like, I think Bill would have a much better chance if Dan Snyder was still owning the commanders. Nut job. Yeah. Right. But now it's Josh Harris, who is all in on analytics. He's been all in on analytics with the Sixers. And that's just how he's approached it. His first big hire was someone by the name of Eugene Shen who is now the commander's senior vice president of football strategy, and his responsibilities are to oversee all analytics and software development for football operations. Sounds like a guy would be up on a dais at the uh, Sloan Institute for Analytics or exactly. whatever it is. Yeah. And, and that's all well and good, and I, I think it's probably a, a fine hire. But is that somebody that Bill Belichick is going to want to work with on a regular basis? Or is that a waste of his time? Not if he has to get told to go for it instead of kicking field goals to make it three-score games on the road in the NFC title game. No, I don't think he's going to want to work with that guy. What the hell was the situation in Cleveland, too, where they wanted to meet on Fridays to go over the game plan, like with the front office? Like, wasn't that like when Josh was almost going to potentially take a job there? And, like, he backed away from that. Like, you got to look at the setup. Yeah. yeah. You got to look at who do I have to answer to? Down in Atlanta, do I want to see Rick McKay? No, we're not going to deal with this. So, we're not going to do it. Have you the guys? Fit, the fit is not right. Have you guys heard any of the full on assault on the analytics crowd on Felger and Mazda? That was great. Oh, yeah. It was awesome. Waging war. Yeah. Waging war. It's good. Look what it's against, done to baseball. Against analytics. Look what it's done to this kid. Look how yeah. he lives and I think life. that's the problem, right? Yeah. I mean, you can arm yourself with the information and then pick and choose what you want to use. The problem is when you get the information and the information to dictates what the decisions are when, or takes away the decisions from what you're doing. When you treat the right to go to a Super Bowl, the opportunity to go to a Super Bowl in a single game equivalent to, say, a game seven against Chicago, you know what, what, are you, I, what are you doing? You know what I equate the analytics to? AI. You start in the beginning and you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. This is new. This is different. But then it just completely gets away from you. And soon enough, the AI bots are going to kill us all. That's what's happened in sports. That's what's happened in baseball. It is completely destroyed and gutted what we enjoyed about the sport. And now it's starting to invade football. And that's really the problem. Mm -hmm. Everything in moderation, including your data. I like that. That's what it needs to be. I think you're right. But unfortunately... The nerd bots have already killed baseball. They've they've come for everyone. The computer overlords have slaughtered all the natural beings. Should be a tool in the tool belt, right? That, that's tool that's fine. Tool I'm not that's looking all. to get rid of analytics departments. I think they're valuable as long as you have someone who's got a functioning brain that wants to pick and choose what should be sort of incorporated and used to your advantage. Whether that's in scouting, whether that is in game decisions, but not just... Well, the analytics say, no matter what, go we, for we it. Go. Well, then what are we doing? That's useless. Now, now you've just third ruined. five. We run the ball because we're going for it on, on on fourth and two. Be ready. Get two calls ready. So no, I don't think Bill is into the analytics like that, and I don't think he's going to answer to someone who spits numbers out of a computer form every day. Here's the follow up though: Does he have to be if he wants a job? No. Does he have to be accepting of it? Does he have to make that concession and say, you know what? I may never work again. In the if I'm not willing to work with, I'm going to pull up his name again here, yeah. Eugene Shen. If I'm not willing to work with Eugene Shen, then I, I may never get a job. So well, is then, the so pull for that. coaching that strong for Bill Belichick that he's willing to make a concession? In that it should regard? be more personnel-based than analytical-based. Concede it in the interview, and then don't listen to him. Yeah. That's what he should do. So he should... Say yes. He should yes them to death in the interview. <laughs> and then when he Tell takes the, the audio job, guy, mute his mic. Turn right back into yeah. Bill Belichick. That's what he should do. 
yeah, Eugene, why don't you uh, why don't you yeah. meet with my uh, my assistant Jeez. here, uh, Bearsh? Yeah, Bearsh got it. Yeah, Bearsh got it. Okay. Why don't you and Bearsh get my oil changed? We'll take that in. <laughs> Rotate the tires. Yeah, I'll, I'll be sure to uh, to take a good look at those reports there, Eugene. That's 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 all. That all looks really good. I know you're working real hard on that. Nobody works harder than Eugene. I've always said that. <laughs> well, you know that better than anybody. <laughs> that's pretty good, Phil. That is rocket science. <laughs> no, yeah, this is great, Josh. Uh, yeah, these numbers, fantastic. We never had numbers like these in New England. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, 617-779-0985. Um, Tom Brady weighing in on how Gerard Mayo will do as head coach. There's that. Also, Tom Brady's dad is talking about Bill Belichick. You know this? Tom Senior. Tom Senior's got some things to say about Bill Belichick. We can get into that. And also the Celtics this hour as well before we talk to Joe Mazzula, who will join us at 1150. Today, Americans of every age are in need of Scott Zola. Mike Bertrand. Essential part of community life. Sports Zola. There was a clip that came out. It was you, Matt Light, and one other talking to Zola, kind of about who Gerard Mayo, you know, is as a player, teammate, everything. And you reference him as Gerard Belichick in it. What do you think the new era of New England with Belichick is going to be, or excuse me, with Mayo is going to be? And how do you feel he will do kind of not having to copy what Bill had done and make his own thing in New England going forward? Yeah, Gerard was a great leader, a great captain, a great friend. I think he had tremendous amount of success in football and then had success in other parts of his life when he retired and then him coming back into coaching I think is great for the NFL and certainly great for the Patriots he's got a great understanding of how things need to be done I think Gerard does an incredible job um, relating to everybody in the locker room all the coaches and I think he'll do he'll do a great job so it's tough for the Patriots it's tough for every team in the NFL after two weekends from now it's going to be tough for 31 other teams for an entire offseason and you know, there's only one great, one happy team at the end of the year, and then 31 other teams are looking how, looking for answers, trying to figure out how to get back. And the Patriots are one of those teams. You know what would be great for Tom Brady in his media career? What? Speaking a little bit more conversationally than he does. Yeah, very extremely articulate. Man, that answer was very stiff. I mean, compare the answer he gave you in the interview <laughs> 15 years ago yeah, and the yeah. answer that he gives today. Yeah, yeah, It's painful. And that's not who he is. He can be... Phil, how engaging can Tom Brady be? Very engaging. And what is that? What very is that conversational. thing? conversational. It's very structured. And that's what he can't do when he calls games. Exactly. Especially now, I think it's more important now than ever because I think that wall has kind of been broken down in media where yeah. guys who are more conversational end up doing a better job. I mean, yep. He's, um, right? I'm going to be honest with you, that clip made me a little bit nervous for my take, which is that Tom Brady's going to be a pretty damn good broadcaster. That is the most laid back show you could ever be on. One of, right? It's yeah. almost like going to McAfee show and you're talking to. You know these guys that are just very he, openly. He's done Manning cast. Do. He's yeah, done the yeah. Manning cast where okay, you're more joking with guys like Peyton and Eli because you're on there and you're giving it back and forth. And you know some of his stuff he does with uh, Jim Gray. St- I don't still don't know why he put stupid Jim Gray on that damn podcast he does. But he has Gronk or Randy on or talking about Snoop. Like he, yeah, it's more laid back. This one it's almost like oh god, this answer is going to get so over scrutinized and put under the microscope that I've got to be so articulate in the way this is delivered. It's where he's going to have to be careful doing broadcasting. It has a pretty good pull. <laughs> outside of, we want outside something of the done, family. We go, to, we go to Gerard Belichick. I think he's trying There's to a complaint within that football football locker room. Nick. Shut up, Tom. Locker room. <laughs> That's going. See, so you got to get it. And I think 20. he had tremendous amount of success in football and then had almost- success in other parts of his life when he retired. And then him coming back into coaching, I think, is great for the NFL. And- AI generated, it sounds. AI generated. I think Randy Johnson taught, taught him how to be a broadcaster. He was a player, and then he was a coach. <laughs> and then he was successful after he played football. 
And now he's coaching football again. And then he went away from Bill. He said he needed to get away from Bill. And now he's back again. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh, and then it was still uh-huh, to uh-huh, Seattle. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then I was traded. And then I left New England. And then he and then he wanted to be a head coach. And then they promised him he could. And then it eventually happened. I could see it when I was there. He, is. The he's too, he, needs to, he needs to be himself more. Is what he um, needs. Relating right. to everybody in the locker room, all the coaches, and I think he'll do a, he'll do a great job. So, okay, he'll do a standard answer. He'll do a great job. Wonderful. It's too stiff, is what it is. But hey, he thinks he's going to be good. Would you expect him to say anything if he thought he was going to do bad? Does, would he say it? No. no, of course not. Which is why I find him to be sort of useless when it comes to giving takes. I don't really care for his takes. You know whose takes I do care for. His dad's. Because that's him. There you go. <laughs> Chris Gasper catches up with Tom Brady Sr. in a story that posted today on the Boston Globe. He's got some great quotes in here. Great quotes. Talking about Bill Belichick. Uh, Tom Brady Sr. is going to bat for Bill Belichick in some ways, saying, I don't think it's fair what I've seen. Everybody saying that it's all Tom. Bill is the best coach in, best coach in football, bar none. The last three or four years of his tenure in New England have been in the dumper. It's too bad. (laughs) It's a shot right there. The dumper. The dumper. (laughs) He said, Bill's tough. He runs a military system. It's a different generation. Bill is a great, great, great coach. But his interpersonal skills are horrible. (laughs) That's the bottom line. Nelson, man. He said, how many times has he said back in 15 or 16 that he wanted to win without Tommy? When he went without Tommy, he didn't know what he was losing. You're losing more than just a quarterback. Ego sometimes gets in the way of things. I think it did with Bill. Now he's in a situation where he's gotten crucified for the last few years by everybody, and a lot of luster has come off his rose. Oh, my. Wow. So he also said this on what Robert Kraft told the Bradys when they returned to Foxborough in September. He tells Gasper, he just said, I made a mistake. We don't all make the right decisions, but he's made a hell of a lot of good ones over the years. But I know that it galls him that Tommy went elsewhere and won. Not that he won, but that he won after Bill said he was done. I wonder where Wickersham got all that. I wonder where Wickersham got those points from. I, I don't know how Gasper summarized this as somehow him sticking up for Bill. I mean, he did a little bit in that first thing oh, by saying it's not all Brady. He's yeah, a great coach. But then he goes on to say Bill loves coaching. But again, I don't know if teams look at Bill. He's 71 now. I don't know that they're going to bend over backward for him to provide him the full array of control that he wants to have. That's the bottom line. Well, that's the same way for his son when he was uh, 42 and he hit the market, right? Thought they were going to be 10 takers. They're like less than two, maybe. Man, great takes here. Great takes from Tom Brady Sr., which, if you ask me, probably reflects what you'd get from Tom Brady if he was just going to let it rip. He might say the same thing. Bill Belichick, best coach in the sport. Great He's the coach. best. And great Tom, coach. Thomas said that. And he said the other day, you know, it made me a better player and all that. And then he might add in if he was just going to be full, fully transparent. But his interpersonal skills are terrible. It was hard to work with that guy. Not every a team in the NFL, after two weekends from now, it's going to be tough for 31 other teams for an entire offseason. And, you know, there's only one great one. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Can you imagine Greg Olson has to lose his job to that? Poor Greg Olson. He knew it. He knew the deal, though. And he signed up. He knew what it was going to be. I think I think he's going to be end up being okay. There's not enough good color commentators out there that Greg Olson's all of a sudden just going to be the number two guy. No. You know. And I, I think he's handled it well. He's sort of poked fun at it and having fun with it. The fact that, you know, it, the dude's going to make a ton of jack. We've got more to get to on Greg yeah, Olson. I know. We can touch on yeah, okay. today. But, uh, yeah. Tom Brady Sr. letting it rip on Bill. Letting it rip. He also said he could turn up somewhere and find 16 games to win in a year, in two years or three. But if he's out after that and the team has reformulated their front office to accommodate his wishes, from their standpoint, I don't know if the magic is worth the accommodations they'd have to make. 
Get Tom Brady Sr. his own broadcast. Get him a podcast and a spot on one of the uh, games. A Brady cast. This guy doesn't hold back at all. He just shoots it straight. That's all he does. He's got the name recognition. Just say it's it's the Brady cast with Tom Brady. And just don't specify that it's Tom Sr. Let him do it. Uh, great yeah. coach. Great, great coach, he says. But horrible interpersonal skills. <laughs> and if he ends up with another team, it might take him three years to win 16 games. Yeah. Yikes. But he's sticking up for him. Yikes. Uh, he said he enjoys watching Mahomes, by the way. And said, however, when Tommy was coming through, you had Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, and Ben Roethlisberger around. Now, when you want to win, Mahomes is the only guy. So who's really on his level? We just witnessed it for two weeks. It's kind of right. It ain't. It's not Lamar. Josh Allen, kind of. Problem is, yeah, I think he's forgetting about Burrow because you didn't see him this year. You know, you get hurt early, and then it's sort of like, what have you done for me lately? And the one stability is Mahomes, and it was his son, and it was Roethlisberger playing hurt all the time. It was Manning never going away, always going to have to go through him, even when he was in Denver. You know, Peyton was the one guy that just never, never went away. Yeah, Ben, you could handle him. The headline, Tom Brady Sr. is going to bat for Bill Belichick. Yeah, not totally. Not really. He takes a couple good shots in there after he says he's the best coach ever. Yeah. Calls him a great, great, great head coach, but also then goes off on the to rose. sort of say some things that don't reflect well on Bill. Doesn't have good personal skills <laughs> dealing with people. Yeah, then he gets to hacking. Great yeah. coach, but. Yeah, but. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, Here's just 500 uh, words on why he sucks. Yeah, you want to realign your front office for that guy? And it's going to take him three years to win 16 games. What's the word he used? Dumpster? <laughs> dumpster? He used a dumper. 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 A big dump of poop <laughs> in your pants. <laughs> he should have said pooped his He's pants. He's in the dumper. Goes to bat for him, but beats him over the head with it. Is yeah. this is this Tom Brady Sr. going to bat for Bill Belichick? This, this line right here that he shares from Robert Kraft, okay. where he says, Robert Kraft told the Bradys, quote, I made a mistake. Yeah. That's... Tom Brady Sr. pointing out it was Bill's call. I mean, Bill Bill wanted him gone, but it was who had the real final decision here. Robert yeah. told us it was, you know, he's the owner, then right? he went with Bill, and he believed Bill, and he shouldn't have. He should have backed Brady and not Bill. And I think there's some real feelings there still. Oh, yeah. Couldn't, yeah, couldn't have wanna, found a way to figure this out, Robert? He didn't want to leave. Couldn't have figured that out? Yeah, didn't want to leave. So I believe that Robert told him that. But we just don't I, – I feel like we don't hear that all that much. What's the number? I keep yeah. public commentary. I keep hearing the number, 18 instead of 25. Like, all they wanted was 25, the, the two for 50, the Breeze guy. Yeah, the Breeze deal. Yep. Is that where do you want – year to year to time at 18. Kendrick Perkins has clarified his comments on Joe Missoula. We'll talk to Joe Missoula at 11.50. Let's get into some of that coming up next. We're back with more Zolak and Bertrand on the Sports Hub. Front court, Derek White gets it in safe to Tatum. Pacers will not foul. A handoff to Holiday. He will not shoot. Clock hits triple zeros. And the Celtics survive another one. They win the season series from the Indiana Pacers, and they get taken in a minute 48. But they survive again, and the Boston Celtics have a four-and-a-half game lead atop the Eastern Conference. The final score, Boston 129, Indiana 124. Celtics fend off the Pacers last night at the Garden. Part of this big, long home stretch for the Celtics. Big scoring output early last night. Needed some strong defense late in the game to seal the deal, 129-124. Pacers are a thorn in their side, man. Pacers are a problem for this team. It's a matchup issue for them, but like, What's really changed, you know, for this team too, and you, you, you know, and I know I got this big home stretch where they should they should take care of all these teams, right? They play great at home, um, but it says only four and a half game lead. Feels like they have a bigger lead than that. You know, just when you watch these teams, like they, they, the Celtics should be up like seven games right now. That's the way it feels. Four games, that's striking distance, man. But I, I have no doubt, like, they're not going to be there at the top at the end. Like, you know, let's, let's get to the playoffs and all that. But it's the biggest thing Joe's got to manage here. You know, these dips. And I know the big output last night, 81 points. Like, you know, get Porzingis back. Like, that, 
when he's out there, like you're a different team. It's a different team. You just got to manage, manage your health, get to the end here, and you should be all right. But I mean, that's a that's a team that that gives you trouble. They do. Is Porzingis your second most important player? If you're the For, Celtics, you know that's a good question. I think you Phil, can make but the I think, argument that he's your second most important player just because of how different it looks when he's out there versus when he's not. It's such a different team without Smart, you know, and the and sort of the chemistry that you've had to have that forced chemistry over the years to where now you could tell if it's right this this should be the guy that gets you over the hump. And I know the way you you phrase that because you say, okay, it's Tatum Brown. It might be Porzingis health wise because the the expectations of what Brown and Tatum are going to give you every night. And that's the difference that you have that you didn't have with Smart. Yeah, you may be a little bit better defensively, but you know, you still got Drew Holiday, you still got Derek White, you still have guys you could bring in off the bench. Like, we, we know what um, you know the little guy can give you every once in a while, but like he's he's not going to stop guys the other night like Kawhi Leonard. Like that's where you get some matchup problems. But if you have all five of your guys, you should be all right, six seven deep. You know, and he's going to shorten his bench in the playoffs. I'm sure. Just felt like two nights ago against the Pelicans, and they end up winning that game. And it all works out in the end. But two games ago against New Orleans, it felt like, boy, you could really use somebody that's protecting the rim here. You could really use somebody that can make a three. They were so cold early in that game. And just removing that one shooter, removing that one rim presence defensively, it changes everything for them. And so, so you get you, that rim you, protector. You does he play need it him that to way? Stay healthy. Does he play it that way? Do, do they Or do they still do what they do? I mean, okay, we get the big rim protector, but we're still going to float him outside. Do you bury his ass down inside? Would that happen? I don't know if it would happen with this team. Because the way they have to spread it and run. He's just so important to their success on both ends of the floor that I might put him, I'm not saying he's a better player, but he might be more important than Jalen Brown. I might be I might be willing the size. to say that. The size, too. Yeah, you have to play completely differently. They didn't have Cornette the other night either. So, man, Al Horford had to play a bunch. And that's just, you know, he's... He's a, he's still obviously an effective player, but he's not Porzingis when Porzingis is right. Guy's been tremendous for them. Tremendous. And it's like it feels like Brad knows that's the missing piece too. Like when this all came together, like that's the guy we wanted. That's he fits what we want to do. Well, now I'm wondering if the missing piece is player to be named later <laughs> that they acquire via trade because they need some size. Because there is a chance he's banged up. There is a chance he misses a playoff game or two or more. And then you've got to play a completely different style. You're never going to find another Porzingis. No, you're you might not. be able to find somebody that can help you in some of the ways he helps you on both ends. Right. And the other part is that this is the same issue we talked about when they acquired Porzingis. Mm-hmm. Right? What did we say? We said, well, the big question will be, is he, going to be there? Is, is he going to be healthy? But their depth there is not good. And Al Horford misses time and is managed. And at his age... You know, you've got to sort of make sure that he's in the best condition possible when you get to playoff time if you're expecting him to play every game, which may not be the case. And you're in the same spot. So this is not like it's an issue that snuck up on them, Phil. They may have known, and I know that Joe Mazzula has said that when healthy, we've got everything we need. Okay, when healthy is sort of a big thing. When healthy is not guaranteed. So I think that's why you've started to see uh, the experimentation of of Tatum playing center for a few minutes here and there. They're trying to see how that helps them, how that helps them in rebounding. Like, they're sort of playing around with that. You saw it for just a moment last night, but Joe Mazzola has tinkered with this. Like, how can we use Tatum differently when you don't have Porzingis on the floor and you don't have Luke Cornett last night? Like, there's 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 a need there, and I think that's it. I think you've identified it. I just wonder if you're ever going to be able to find that kind of size that's going to be usable for you, right? Because they do have limitations financially. Our guy Chris Forsberg at NBCSportsBoston.com the other day had a whole post on on potential trade targets for them. It's not a lot of bigs. They're they're big wings. They're guys who could give them some depth there. More versatile defensive pieces, guys that could help you up, you know, help you out in terms of rebounding and things yeah. like that. If you're missing some of your bigs, but. There's not a seven-footer on the list, I don't believe. And again, because of some of their limitations financially and, and how much they can spend on a guy without sending a whole lot of money out, it's going to limit you. It's going to be a real definition of a, of a role player. You know, you can tell on the boards, too. 37-year-old Thaddeus Young. Yeah, you know, you that's could, the kind of thing you're looking at. And you can tell on the boards, too. Like, 12-2, to two, they got out rebound on the offensive glass, even in that first half when they hit 81. Like, they're going to be hot. 
they're not going to have shots. They're going to be fine. But when you get advanced into the playoffs, you get to the second round, third round. Now, all of a sudden, you start scheming some things up defensively against you. And what are you going to have to counter it? That's going to see how much you learned from last year. And they are preparing for this, it feels like, in some ways. Yeah. I mean, two, two nights ago, I mean, you got Drew Hall. We know how versatile a defender Drew Holiday can be. And Derek White and Jason Tatum. And they, they've got a number of guys that can play a number of different positions. But watching Drew Holiday go against Zion Williamson, giving up about 100 pounds in the post, that's they're lucky they have a guy like that. You just can't depend on that consistently if that's the kind of thing that you're leaning on in critical situations. That's my guess. Yeah, like like Peyton Pritchard matched up on Kawhi Leonard there too. Like that's you're not going to win. Peyton that. Pritchard last year on Jimmy Butler. Yeah. You know they, these things yeah, happen great. in the postseason, and all of a sudden you're looking at it and saying, "Oh, that's a horrible matchup for us." <laughs> Why are we relying on that in a game we have to win right now? You have no choice. That's what you want to try to avoid. Right. Uh, by the way, Joe Mazzulla did uh, talk about uh, briefly about Perk the other day, referring to himself as a, a bird brain. Yep. But the reverse of two yeah, brains. Just right? sort of left a hint in there. We'll get to what Perk has actually said. But before we do that, why don't we talk to Joe Mazzula himself? He will right. join us coming up next. So and I don't think that's a thing. On 98.5 The Sports Hub. I wish you would step back from that ledge, my friend. You could cut ties with all the lives that you've been living in. Welcome back to Zolak and Bertrand. We go to the Volkswagen Dealers Expert Hotline to welcome in Joe Mazzula. He's brought to you by East Coast Metal Roofing, the official roofing partner of the Boston Celtics. The roofs are guaranteed for life and are available in all sizes and colors, including green. Mention 98.5 the Sports Hub and get 10% off your entire roof installation. Visit EastCoastMetalRoofing.com. Joe, how are we doing? All right, we got another. Uh, what would you guys see in Phil that you signed him to attend there? <laughs> He's got uh, good intangibles. Uh, he's got uh, leadership qualities that we really like. Uh, a lot of, lot of really strong he does, things. He imitates Bill Belichick the best out of any of our He does that, too. So he's got the edge. Great there. personality. I, I think Phil should talk to Joe Mazzula as Bill Belichick. I think that would be great. And then I could talk as myself. <laughs> well, I bet Joe does a great Bill Belichick impression because those guys have spent a lot of time together, I know. So for sure, like yeah. if, so, I, I I can't just you know yeah, but Bill, you Joe. were Bill's whipping boy. Right, come on, let's conference. let's hear it, Phil. Ready, Phil? <laughs> Joe, I mean, I, listening to you talk about it, expectations in the media. I mean, can we just can we try to ignore the noise thing, just one time for me, Joe? Please. I mean, what, what do we talk about expectations for? I mean, what do these guys know? So what's the media know anyway, Joe? Let's be real. <laughs> Gary Washington you can't ignore the noise. <laughs> uh, I read that. I read what you told uh, D- Dan Shaughnessy that you're embracing both the uh, criticism and the noise that is good and bad. I mean, I think it's important, right? I think your relationship to both of those things, everybody says to ignore it, but uh, I don't think that's uh, true. I also don't think it's um, possible. And so everybody always look. Everybody only looks at the relationship to criticism. But I think you know I've really focused on the relationship to praise and. Listening to praise can be just as detrimental as listening to criticism. So I think you have to have a healthy relationship, understand uh, you're going to get both, and it's just a matter of uh, what you focus on. You know what I mean? I mean, we heard Perk say that you've got a bird brain, and then we heard you uh, reference that the other day. Uh, I'm always <laughs> I'm always sort of surprised how people, when you reference that the other day, I've heard people get all over you for even referencing it, and I, I don't really see no. the big. I don't. I don't see the big deal in that, right? I mean, I, I don't get that part of it. I never have. I'm. I'm curious if you feel that same way. Like, what's the big deal? I mean, what's the big deal about anything? You guys seen Bronx Tale? Yeah, yeah of course. God, great movie, right? Got a little weird. I think it's good. Uh, yeah. Hardy, who we fired, kicked him off this show. Yeah, he's on with us. He anyway. thinks that movie stinks. I don't get well, that's that. Why we fired. That's why you guys fired. Well, he had right. to go. Move and on. we we don't know where Phil Perry lands on Bronx Tale. Well, that's seen important it. for the next ten days. He hasn't seen it. I haven't seen it. Oh Jeff. no! Jeez. Back to Portland what? you go, Phil. See so now you this go back a... to like. So now you go to like Whiplash, and it's like, what's worse, the guy that messes up the 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 band, or the guy that doesn't know that he's not messing up, 
and get uh, kicked out. Like, what's ooh. worse? So I have seen whiplash. Seen yeah, yeah. That, that's great. I know. <laughs> Bronx Tale, though, th- listen, this is a blind spot. We've talked about this on the show before. These guys had me do a review of Perfect Storm because I had never seen Perfect Storm until about a year ago. Reese so I had to too. go home, wow. do a little homework, watch it. We did about a 15-minute conversation on Perfect Storm. Got to do a breakdown. Yep. So that, that's next next week's radio is a let's let's do let's pick a movie and let's do a review of that movie on for the next next week. Joe, you'd be surprised how many of these beat weirdos that cover the team, like Mike Reese too for ESPN, never saw yeah. Perfect Storm. Well, we can't like do the town. We, we live here. We've already we've already. So had... Are you going Perfect Storm? Are you going Perfect Storm or Manchester by the Sea? Oh, yeah, you can watch Storm. Manchester by the Sea one time, and that's it because. That is not a movie as great of a film in terms of how it was made. That is such dark, like depressing content. I don't. I don't ever want to see that movie again. I think it's a beautiful movie. I, I it is. Casey Affleck did a great job. I, I don't. It's, want, it's a great movie. Do you want to? Do you want to kick back and watch it every night like you do with the town? Uh, so two things. One, I don't want to kick back and watch it, but I I, I do watch it multiple. I will watch it multiple times. And the interpretation of kicking back and watching the town. So when I was an assistant, I would do my post game edits right after the movie. And so it was a movie that I would put on as background to, to get through my post game routine right after the game so that I could wake up the next morning and do whatever I had to do. So I don't watch it nearly as much anymore. And so that's kind of the kind of thing. That's like the meaning of like, I always watch the town. It was background noise for my post game routine as an assistant. That's <laughs> Movie but Manchester by the Sea, I've probably watched like three or four times. All right. That's three more times than I've seen it. I think I've seen it once and I haven't gone back. All right. I haven't gone back but for it. To answer your original question, you got to have fun, I think. And, and, and that's something that yeah. we learn. It's like, it, there's a, it's a, you know, life's a boxing match, give and take, push and pull. And like, there's, there's nothing too good, nothing too bad. Everything's just about what it is. And you, you just got to have fun with it. And you can't take yourself too serious, you know? Yeah. Well, how about the game last night? Let's get to let's get, let's get to these. Um, let's get to Indiana here. What 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 gives them? What gives you fits about that team? The matchups. You know, is this uh, thing advances yeah, here? Their pace, and so they do an unbelievable job um, of just continuing to play uh, fast. And so, like you know, as, as people in the league talk about like playing fast, you can do that in different ways. And so we play fast in a different way, but Indiana plays fast where. They're just constantly moving. They're constantly putting pressure on your defense. You're constantly in rotations. Every single guy can uh, create off the dribble. So, like, you have to guard the basketball, but they're also great shooters. So, like, you got to – your your help has to be disciplined, and then they do a good job of, like, crashing the offensive glass when you're kind of in no man's land. Like, are you helping or are you guarding your guy? And so they're, they're, they can put pressure on teams with their pace throughout the entire game, and that's why they're never out of a game. And, uh, you know, they're a really, really – Hard playing team and a difficult team to play against. Joe has seen the last two nights. Derek White makes some really critical plays late in games to help you guys win. And last night you called him a genius after the game for for giving no, he, uh, giving up a foul. And you said he he made a genius play, I believe it was correct. Yeah, no, I mean, um, you know, we talk a lot about situational basketball. I have great conversations with the team, and and Derek's one of the guys that uh, he prides himself in recognizing. Uh, just situational opportunities and executing those. And uh, he's just a, a extremely smart player. Is he an all-star, Joe, in your opinion? Should he be an all-star? Because I, I, I noticed he made some comments in terms of what you believe makes an all-star. It's offense, it's defense as well. So Sometimes it's metrics that don't show up on the box score. Is he one of those guys for you? Should he be an all-star this year? I tell you what, my number one goal, I think, especially for our team, when you have a group of guys who are as talented as they are, and, um, you know, our entire roster, you have to be able to define what, you know, quote unquote, all-star level looks like, because I think in today it's just strictly about points and uh, clickbait and like, how can you just generate attention, uh, you know, you know, from fans. And like, we really got to take a look at uh, what it means to be an all-star in my opinion, and how you truly affect the game and how you affect your team and like your value to the team. And we have so many guys that have the highest of value and, they're willing to put aside what may look like uh, stats uh, to be a great player and like have impact on the game. And you take a look at both D white and Tatum is like, you know, how many, how many superstars do you know that uh, want to be defined by both defense and offense by playmaking, by being a great teammate, by doing all those things. And we have a bunch of guys that are like that top to bottom. And I think D white is an all-star 
because he's on he's on uh, all of our guys are on the other team's best players throughout the entire game. Uh, he can defend on ball, off ball, block shots. Uh, his ability to make timely momentum plays. Uh, he can score off the dribble and pick and roll, catch and shoot. And so, like, we have a bunch of guys that can do that night in and night out, and uh, they're starting to see how they positively impact each other. But, yeah, I do think he is because of the right reasons, in my opinion, of what an all-star is. Hey, Joe, did uh, Sam Cassell and Buddy Heald kiss and make up after the game last night? It looked like Buddy Heald had it pissed him off during the course of the game. <laughs> no, it was, it's all in good fun. Buddy Heald's got a great personality. Uh, Sam's got a great personality. But listen, like, there's rules. And the number one rule is, like, we don't let guys shoot shots, uh, practice shots in front of our bench. And um, that's just an important rule, and it's a standard that you have to have is, you know, we're not just going to let guys feel good about themselves. And so Sam did a great job uh, being alert, getting out, contesting, and um, that just kind of generated a good conversation throughout the game. But we're just not going to allow that to happen. You know, I don't know that it's pretty badass. Yeah. I I don't know that we've spent much time talking about Sam this year, but what has he meant to you and and the staff and the team this season? Uh, I mean, the things he does, when you talk about intangibles, you know, he's a guy that uh, his humility and his loyalty is like top notch. And there's very few people in the NBA that can reach every level uh, of an organization, of a roster, of the bench. And so he's worked with some of the best coaches. Um, he's worked with the best players, and he's been uh, a starting point guard on a championship team. He's been the third string point guard on a championship team. He's been a role player. He's been traded. Um, you know, he's been fired. He's been through pretty much everything that you could possibly go through in an NBA as a player and a coach. And so, like his wisdom and experience is uh, just really important for our for our organization. Hey, uh, are you familiar with Barstool Sports, Joe? You are, right? Dave Portnoy. Yeah. Um, he did the pizza review Portnoy's of huge, D. Paul Mary's. Portnoy's a huge, uh, Portnoy's a huge West Virginia fan. He's a big uh, Bob Huggins fan. That's right. That's right he is. But he did uh, yeah. D. Paul Mary's. I he did a pizza a review. Fan too. Yeah. You'll see him courtside. He gets in yeah, your face. Yeah. Gave, gave, gave right. D. Paul Mary's a bad grade. Did he really? Well, he's not a red pizza guy. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. I mean, that's not for everybody. No. And he said, if, he said if it's Providence food, people are going to starve down in Providence. <laughs> <laughs> But he loves the bakery. Go, Love the bakery. Tell you what, there's another place. I'm, I'm going to stop by there on Monday. I'm going to go down on Monday. Uh, I think I don't know if this place is still open, but Silvio's like Rosamia Pizza, unbelievable Sicilian pizza. Uh, Smart, really good. Okay. Yeah, he, All right. Are you? Yeah, what, did we ask you this? Are you a Caserta guy? Caserta's? Yeah, I like, okay. I like Caserta. All right. Yeah. Are so you? Is it? Oh, I love Caserta. So is it similar? More yeah. similar to Caserta's? Uh, I, I, it's different. I think okay. Caserta's is thinner, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's a yeah. thin yeah. square. Caserta's thin. Like, Rosamia's is, like, thick, a lot of cheese. You got to, like, almost cut it again because the, oh, like that. when, you, when you, like, you pick it up yeah. and you bring it to the mm-hmm. house, you got to, like, recut it because the cheese is so thick, you know? Got to it harden up a little bit. Got to recut the, the pie. Bring it in. Uh, yeah. You know, we're talking Providence. We're talking uh, basketball. We're talking college basketball. You got any thoughts on Ed Cooley and his return to Providence over the weekend? Uh-huh. Uh, no, but how about Damon beating uh, North Carolina yesterday? Yeah. Doesn't interest us as much. Yeah. The, the Ed Cooley stuff. Yeah. yeah. You're just trying to get your yeah. thoughts yeah. on Cooley. Thought we'd get a yeah. good quote by you we could just put out there on the, yeah, nothing. Yeah. I'll tell you what, we had season tickets in section 108 at the. Uh, 